Have you seen the debunked data point? Wait, what am I really doing with this? The debunked data point that foreign that foreign ten Americans can't save for, don't don't have uh, four hundred dollars. Yeah, I know it's not true. You know it's not true, right? That's so what we were talking about. I've, I, I I've, love the reaction. I've found myself defending BlackRock a lot these days. Mm, that's interesting. How does from that the, make you feel? From the nonsense. How does that make you feel? I like BlackRock. To be defending BlackRock. Well, I'll tell you. I have, to, I have to defend their honor. No, it's not It's not them. It's just misinformation <laughs> that they own they, corporate America. They don't need it's you. Now, <laughs> no, I know. Hold on. No, it's not. But good. I was talking to somebody mm -hmm. at dinner about this. I'm like, but it's our money. Like, it's. But anyway. So you believe BlackRock owns corporate America? Well, but listen, yes, but they own it with our money. It's our money, right? So, so right, yeah. it's not yeah, other yeah. money. So wait, so oh, here's in defense right. of BlackRock. It's our money. Yeah. More than half the assets that BlackRock manages are for retirement. Yeah, we help that. about 35 million Americans invest for life after work. That's a quarter of the country's workers. Mm -hmm. So that's my defense of BlackRock. But here's the bullshit. In Larry Fink's recent letter, he said four in ten Americans can't. Yeah. Come up. That's that's nonsense. But he linked to. It's a, it's a he linked to he linked to irrelevant investor. Yeah, lol. <laughs> That was my nonsense. No, it's from. Gotcha. It's, it's a Federal Reserve Board publication, Economic Well Being of U.S. Households in 2022. But the problem is it's 86 pages, so I can't find the data point. Oh. Uh, it's it's, it's oh, made up. Yeah. Wait, no, I got it. I've seen that debunked by Ben Carlson. A million times, right? <laughs> Didn't I think, it, I think, yeah, no, I think no, it's no the way they phrased the question. Oh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we got to get the label. Four dollars in a cash right. emergency. No free advertising. Yeah, no free advertising. Nope. We got to charge. We got to start charging now. Listen, like you're such a journalist. Yeah, Four, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Remaining objective. Yeah. Oh no, no, no! This is about getting the bag. So, like, <laughs> getting they, the bag. Yeah, they want. Beyonce they want. Always get the bag. They want. Yeah, they want some yeah. advertising. They're gonna have to pay. How's my uh, forehead? <laughs> is what it is. Did you put right. I tried. Oh, here we go. You tried. You did his best. Yeah. Here we go. I just. I feel like Beetlejuice. Uh, Wait, what? You know. You know the Whack Packer Beetlejuice. Mm, no. Okay. I am not familiar with this person. No? no. What? No. When you don't have a hat on and you have headphones on your head? <laughs> you don't look like Beetlejuice. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, I was making my IRA contribution the other day. And this new thing that I started doing, the same time I make the contribution, I also make a contribution at the Metropolitan Detention Center to Sam Bankman Freed's commissary. Hey. So, I'm, so I'm doing so. I'm enjoying, enjoying listen, some cigarettes. I don't want credit. I don't. I, listen. I don't want credit. I Take just. Uh, I want to make sure that young man has peanut butter money. You know what I mean? What's What's the new thing? Um, we we had a. Uh, He's gonna come out with more money than anybody you know. You think? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Just because. Because things in crypto are like are bubbling again. Yeah. And he didn't like liquidate everything he owns. His family no was way. rich. There's no way. His, he, he never once did that family complain to the judge that like they don't have the money to continue their defense or any of that. They have endless money still. Endless. Endless. And by the time that bankruptcy, liquidation, proceeds, blah, 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 that could go on for like 12 years. I'm telling you, he's going to come out ahead. One thing I yeah. forgot to ask about is like, can, can we play the video? My, my bonds video? I don't have sure. I don't have it handy, can, but we definitely can. I can, I can send it. Okay, I can, I can send it. It's Are we not talking hard to find. bail bonds or real bonds? No, re treasury bonds. Oh, okay, okay. We're talking treasury bonds. We, un we unwrapped over SDF. bonds. Oh, we <laughs> I wrapped about bonds. Yeah, we made you a did whole. We made a whole song and a music video. Oh, please about share. Bonds. Please so share. speaking of prison, my wife used to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, hey. Hey. confessions. <laughs> My wife used to love the show Locked Up. I think it was on the Discovery Channel or Nat Geo. Mm, like for mm. years. Do you remember that show? What did she like about it? Everything. Wait, the reality show? Yeah. It was in like a Supermax prison? Yeah, she would watch it for hours. Did you watch Oz? Are you too young for Oz? Uh, a little bit. But but I bring this up because there's a new show on Netflix called Unlocked. A jail experiment. And this is a hardcore penitentiary. Mm. And they let the prisoners out without guards. And they try and foster like a community and like... <laughs> That just good. took Dude, that's a 180. Yeah. That actually I, so I, I only saw the I only saw the premise. I haven't seen the execution. I'm sure oh, that's gonna uh, go. I don't know how it's gonna go. We'll see. I mean, I believe in humanity, yeah. but I also believe in Shanks. So <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not I'm not quite sure. And you're you're throwing a lot out right now. Man. That's <laughs> we've been you've been doing a lot. I've been trying to find this video, and in that time, wait, I wonder if a lot. I wonder if in those situations when they're filming in a prison, they're clearly getting consent from from the people they're filming, because by law you have to. Mm. I wonder if they're also making payments because you basically have like, you basically have like, they're the, technically they're the talent. They're the thing that people are tuning in to see. They should. I wonder should if they have paid. to. They must, they must have to. Yeah. Well, but then there are laws about people who are locked up earning money. 
Right. They earn very little. Like you can get something, but it's you like you get something, but they're really not something? supposed to profit like because not, of the crimes they've committed. Right. But you're not profiting from the from the crimes. At that point, you're profiting from being on a prison yeah. TV show, which is different. Yeah. That's true. So I think they probably it's probably like prison wages though. Like the prison probably gets money. These are probably mm. private prisons, would be my guess. Michael also watches prison housewives. Dude, I swear, <laughs> thousands of not maybe not thousands. Is that a thing? Hundreds of hours watching locked up. We used to fall asleep to it because my wife loved that show. Um, no, it's not a real thing, but oh. most of the husbands of the Real Housewives do end up statistically in jail. Yes, most, I did know this. Like yeah. over fifty percent. It's like an it's an insane okay. number. Yeah. I think every seat, every show, every individual show, like uh, New Jersey, etc., somebody goes to jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the psychology of those people volunteering to be on that show fascinates me. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's dangerous but because I, they're all dating it. and or married to shady men. Right. Or mo most of them. Well, right? I shouldn't uh, co-sign on that. Let me take back my co-sign of what you said, Josh. <laughs> I don't I don't know. That's an Deon's interesting point. All of them. It, no, it just, <laughs> it seems like there are like financial crimes being uncovered by virtue of these people being under a spotlight. Yeah. And being on a show like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was one from the OC who had a whole yes. documentary about her. And I can't think of the name right now. Oh, Michael know it. Yeah, no, it's no, the no. lawyer he's guy. Afraid to say the, he's afraid to say the name because he goes to BravoCon. No, uh, I don't. No. <laughs> do. My wife does love, I mean, a lot of wives love BravoCon. <laughs> All right, that's where, that's too far. That's where you're like, uh, let me set the record you straight. It's either the real, real Housewives and Locked Up. Those, that's her two things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If only somebody could combine the two. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> It'd be a fire show. Prison Wives. <laughs> Coming to TLC. So, show. oh, uh, has anybody seen, I was too busy not to brag today to look at the market, but Apple... I just checked. Apple's up 3%. Is there news? I mean, it's a big fat candle. 3.5%. Any that news? Big. You were on TV question. today. Any Apple news? There must be. Uh, it doesn't just go up 3.5% for no you reason. You know what? I don't think we talked about it. But the biggest thing we were talking about halfway through the day today was going green after the mini inflation panic of uh, yesterday. Wow. It's, we cycle through these panics really fast now. That's crazy. You were Apple's up 3% and you didn't talk about we it. We didn't get three it. 3.5. That's a yeah, big that's move wild. for three Apple. And a half, yeah, mm -hmm. By the way, so the yeah. S&P is now flat as of two days ago. So everything that happened yesterday. Didn't happen. I started, that's, that's the second I mean. time that happened. That happened last week too. After that, like the little yeah. mini sell-off. Yeah. Then... This market is just strong. I don't think we've hit strong. a 3% sell-off all year. We haven't had two in like uh, since November. We technically had two. I did Intraday? look at this. Oh. Intraday? I did, no, on a closing basis. When? We had two point. Oh, four percent. When? Re just recently? <sighs> uh, I can't remember the day that we hit the low, but I'll never like forget a few it. days ago. I lost everything. <laughs> I love the fact day. check. I'm, I'm sorry, Kelly. No, 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 you, you very well maybe right. Well, let's go to let's go to the scoreboard. <laughs> Ooh. Let's that, go to the replay. That was one that was one of the tougher days in my career. Mm. The the one point one percent Dow Jones that, no, uh, no, decline. No, no. It hasn't even happened. Mm -mm. It hasn't happened? Mm -mm. The streak remains. The streak. All right. Listen. My name, I want to double check look, that, look, but look. I can't do two things. My name is Paul, and that's between y'all. <laughs> no, okay, this is what it is. You look at SPY, I was looking at the index. Pro move. Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh, then, then I believe you. I stand corrected. Yeah. Michael, sometimes. Sometimes. Michael looks at the ETF, but yeah. you're a professional. Right. I mean, 90% of people look at the ETF. You're looking at the index real. level. Yeah. That's what you can invest in. That's You're right. She's right. She's right. As, just, of course she's right. Of course, course she's she is. Right. I was, yeah, of I believed in Cali the Listen, whole time. I'm a, I'm a basic bitch. I look at the ETF. Cali <laughs> nailed it. No, I think I'm the basic B. No, no. I think I'm the no, basic No, no, no. It's me. No. It's me. We yeah. clapping? Is everyone set? Let's do it. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. I still feel naked without a hat, but it is what it is. The Compound and Friends, episode 138. Today's show is brought to you by Global X. Since 2008, Global X ETFs have been committed to empowering investors with unexplored and intelligent solutions. GlobalX specializes in ETFs that track emerging trends like the rise of artificial intelligence as well as strategies aimed to generate high income potential. Visit GlobalXETFs.com to explore a lineup of more than 90 ETFs along with insights to help you navigate a dynamic investing landscape. 138. This is, this, guys, this is two returning champions on one show. I'm super excited. This is the compound and friends. Nicole's dancing. My name is Downtown Josh Brown. If you're listening for the first time. The show is about money, investing, the economy, Jail. trading, making contributions to Sam Bankman-Fried's commissary. Yeah, yeah. 
and it's about life. And uh, man, well, we we lucky today. Uh, two returning champions. Dion is here. Dion Rabone is an award-winning journalist writing about markets and the economy. You've seen his work in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Reuters, Yahoo Finance, the New York Times, ESPN, and others. Dion, welcome back. So good to have you. Hey, thank you it's so much for having me. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. You have some notes from your last appearance. Yeah, okay. We're going to go right. back through that. All right. All right. You were right. You were right. Uh, Callie Cox is here, ladies and gentlemen. What's up? Callie's a market strategist who's passionate about teaching everyday investors the power of investing for their wallets and their lives. Most recently, she was U.S. investment analyst at eToro, where she educated 2 million customers about stocks, nice. crypto, option markets through timely reports and strategic initiatives. Callie, welcome back to the show. What's I know up? there's a lot so more. Your your bio is expanding by the day. <laughs> I love your intros. I feel bad. I didn't give you guys as good an intro when I had you on the podcast, and I feel bad about it. Hey, now. let's talk about that. Let's that was a, <laughs> that was that was a that was a good episode. It was. Did. It was a good episode. Very timely. Bank earnings are at the end of this week. Yeah. So all right, yeah, that, so we, that, that was, was cool. the, the whole thing with the show is like we were looking ahead to what was coming. So yeah, like you guys it. broke it down, dropped a lot of knowledge. Previews are underrated in financial media. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do reactions because, of course, like news happens and. You know, somebody has to round it up. Right. There's not as many previews from yeah. my perspective as there are. Now, I understand why. Harder to right. do a preview because you might have to Harder predict to something that doesn't happen. Right. Right. So I, but you I can like preview previews. what's coming up and talk yes. about what's happening. I think that there are no, not no, but I think that there aren't as many good previews. Well, there's no audience for a preview. Who cares? Just I'll wait the and I'll say. Cares. No, but, the also, but the audience doesn't care. I don't want to. Uh, that's a bad hear. take. That's, that is, that's, that's a bad take. That's a bad take. Who cares? Yeah, we're about to pile on you. <laughs> Hold on. If, you, if you're if you invested in a stock, let's say, yeah. and two days before the company reports earnings, you come across an article that's a preview of the earnings. I'll wait for the earnings. Really? Yeah. You're skipping it? Yeah, skipping it. All right. Next. Well, I don't, that's rare. If, I don't know about that. <laughs> if I still you hosted a podcast, I would uninvite you to future efforts. Wait, episodes, yeah. Because that would be because, the whole podcast Because was. there's more value in a preview, even if the person writing it doesn't know what's going to happen, just laying yeah. out the things that could happen or mm-hmm. the things other people are watching for. I feel like that has a lot of value. Yeah. yeah. And that was that was what we did on the podcast. It was like we'd talk about an earnings preview coming up and then like an economic indicator. So it'd be like CPIs this week. Here's what to watch. Yeah, for. what's here's consensus? Can... What's the storyline? Like right. what are people expecting? And what if are... it's above consensus, here's what could happen. If it's below, if, you know, that was the whole point of like, and I, I would hear from people a lot. They'd be like, oh, I didn't even realize like next week is, you know, CPI or next week is this. So that's week. a yes. really great point too. Most yeah. people aren't keeping a calendar and thinking about these things. Right. There is no calendar. I'm going to throw that out there. There is no more. everyday investor calendar that's not, easily yeah. accessible that you don't <gasps> have to pay for. Yeah. That's, that's like, forget about the context. Idea? There's nowhere to find it. It's Yeah, it's. I had to put it together myself. Like, yeah, we, exactly. we literally built it. Wait, yeah. Yahoo Finance doesn't have a calendar? It's not good. They or maybe week, they don't do, they have a but week, like this like, is the data guys. coming out this week by day? <laughs> they, no, they'll put so. together like a little – you know, like an article, maybe three, four hundred words, and they'll say, "Here's what's happening this week." And if you can go find that exact article at the exact time, oh shit! Yeah. But there's not just like a calendar. So I downloaded the calendar of the Knicks schedule that I synced with Google Mail, and I don't know how to do things like that. It was really easy. <laughs> like there was a button, like connect this to your Google Calendar. Yes. Um, so now, when the games are happening, I can see them on my calendar. This seems like an obvious thing that somebody should create yeah. for economic data and earnings. I, I feel agree. like I think the problem is probably there's not a way to monetize it successfully. Right. And that's why it doesn't right. exist. put the ads right into the calendar item. Yeah. Listen, I, I don't know. This isn't what I do. Josh but has I know that ups. it doesn't Josh, why don't you do it? Uh, yeah, we Ridholtz Wealth Management oh presents. God. We need yeah. more we, yeah. we need more work. So wait, to do. so before Listen, before we get on I'm t- I want five percent. I want five percent. Yeah, see I want five percent. All right. Yeah. This before is before we get on with the show, Dion, yeah. uh there was news yesterday I saw online that the Wall Street Journal laid off a bunch of their content creators, uh, yes. podcast hosts, YouTube hosts. And unfortunately, you were one of those people. I was one of those people. Yeah. I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, but no, nah, honestly, like, it was crazy. They called me in, uh, put a meeting on my calendar that I didn't even see. And then it was like, right as I'm about to do my live stream, like, live stream's canceled. We have to have an organizational structure meeting. And I was like, oh, Okay. Oh, it's, this I, is how it happens. Yeah, this is how it happens. Okay. So, which which is this my camera? Where, do I have a camera? <laughs> yeah. So, first thing I want to say is f- the Wall Street <laughs> Journal as a staff, record label, and as a motherfucking crew. And if you want to be down with the Wall Street Journal, f- 
you too. Emma yeah. Tucker. Nah, nah, nah. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm Ladies joking. and gentlemes, Tupac I'm, impression. Yeah, not that's, serious. That's, shout, out, shout out my man Tupac. Yo, no, 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 ag- aggregators do not write I, listen, articles about Tupac. Joking, <laughs> joking. I am joking. First of all, let me just, let me actually say. That's going viral. What, what I really want to say is like, I actually am so glad and so happy with the time I spent there. Really, legitimately, shout out to Emma Tucker. Shout out to Charles Farrell, deputy editor in chief. Shout out to Philana Patterson, head of audio, who like let me bring this idea for a podcast to the Wall Street Journal. Mm. Like we were talking about earlier, like I made a rap video at the Wall Street Journal. Like kind of first two ever. rap videos. First like, ever. I think it had to be the first. Charles ever. Dow was not doing that he in wasn't, 1896. He wasn't, and, I, and I dropped some rhymes. Like we had we had some rhymes in this. So I mean, like you did. You had I'm, a cipher. I'm so proud of the work I got to do there, and so happy about my time there. And it was funny because they told me at like 10 a.m. and I just kind of was hanging out at the office, mm. and everybody was like, "Man, you're you're so zen. Like this is this is not what I expected from." And the reason was, I knew I knew I was good. I knew I was fine. And this is one of these things, like, I've been really passionate about talking to people about finance, about, like, trying to tell people, like, yo, you should get in the markets, invest. And it's because of, like, I'm a testament to that, right? Mm. Like, I knew that I'm fine because I've got my investments. Like, I own two houses. I was literally like, which one of my two houses am I going to go to? And I, I didn't, I don't have two house money because of journalism, I have two house money because I was a smart investor because I was a long term investor. I didn't. I didn't make like create. I wasn't. You know, picking the best stocks. We give, you some, we give you some props on but that. Just because I got in the market, I stayed in the market, and that's allowed me to be in a position where, when the Wall Street Journal said, "Hey, your services are no longer necessary. Your position's yeah. been." you know, eliminated. I was like, all right, cool. What's, we're on to the next. Yeah, dude, keep investing. They'll write about you someday. And, and there it you is. But it, it's really, it's just like, I have really been passionate about it. And it's something I care about because of this. So that, you know, it's nice. You can have nice things. Shout yes. out to my $25,000 Rolex watch. <laughs> but like also, but also what's much more important that is just like that security. Yes. And I mm-hmm. knew that if the Wall Street Journal wanted to move on, wanted to go in a different direction, that this partnership can end, I'm good. I'm set. And I'm set and I can I can act that way, right? That's why I can I brought my full self to work. You know, when I didn't like something, I let people know. I didn't have to be afraid. Right. And it was because I know I've got this this set pile of money, I've got these investments. And if this goes south, all right, I'm good. I can set. And that I think is something we don't talk about enough in yeah. in finance when we're doing these things. Yeah. Like we like to have fun. We like and I, you know, I do it too. But getting back to like that fundamental, you know, of like, this is why investing matters. This is why being in the markets matters. It's that security. It's such it's a like, great point because when we're building financial plans for clients in sub segments, this is a very real risk that we need to invest and, and build into the potential outcomes. And then of course, financial plans will change as life events happen. Exactly. But it's a very clear and present life event for most people. I think so. we talk about the why all the time with our clients, but uh, when we're on the microphone, we're talking about the markets, right? And yeah. the, the the important stuff, what you're dealing with, it sort of goes gets brushed under the rug a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it was like 100%. in this moment, I you know I was having lunch with somebody, and she was like, "Yeah, my friend just got laid off, and she's freaking out. She's going crazy." I was like, "Well, yeah, you know, if you didn't, well, prepare. it's a loss of it's a temporary loss of like it's a temporary uncertainty um, because you are going to make a change, but you don't know what it is yet. Right. Yeah. So that's everybody. You know, that's if you sell a company. There's an uncertainty because you're probably going to do something, but you just don't know what it's going to be. Yeah. So everyone feels that at different levels. And it's like a, a loss of security until you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm about to go on my next adventure. But, you know, it's a it's a thing yeah. that yeah. people have to go through. Um. So but I love the way that you're. Uh, handling it. I love the Tupac. Uh, <laughs> yes. I love the Tupac. Uh, R.I.P. Tupac, man. The uh, greatest impression. rapper of all time. So, Callie, the last time you were on this show mm-hmm. was January 2023. And the title. No, of- that's not true. No? I was here in November. Ooh, second fact <clears throat> check. Sean. <laughs> I was here with Malcolm Etheridge. <laughs> okay. But, but, but wow. before that. But before, but before that. that yeah, but the time yeah, before, before that. So, January 2023, the title of the show was We Just Might Pull This Off. And it looks pretty damn good now. You know what else you said? You said uh, you said estimates show S and P five hundred peak to trough earnings decline could be about six percent. It's important to remember that analysts have underestimated corporate America's resilience recently, yeah. and they call. did yet yeah. again. Yeah. And I don't want to I don't want to take too much credit here because first of all, I don't make predictions. Second of all, like we're all going to find ourselves on the wrong side of the the call. But not today. <laughs> <laughs> but that but, day is not today. But. 
I will say, and I went on a rant about this Tuesday night at the Alphaville Pub Quiz. The oh. job market was so strong. When people are making money, they are willing to spend money. Yeah. In, it's in such general. a basic you thing, but we for, that. we kind of like forgot a, like that's the most important thing. Seventy percent of the U.S. Thing. economy is consumer spending. I wasn't at the pub quiz this year. I've been there, but I, I was actually. I didn't. I wish I, there? I saw that. you I did, out of the corner of my eye, okay. but I was. But it's huge the now. It is. Yeah, it was really it was, big. Was it like two hundred people? It was something yeah. like that. I saw more. pictures. It was crazy. Also, I was never on a winning team for that, though. Ben McKenzie was there. Mm -hmm. If anybody knows who Ben McKenzie is, from the blonde dude from the OC, my first teenage crush. Okay. I died. Did you tell him? Yes, I did. I went up to him after a few drinks and I was like, hey, I'm Callie. I've seen the OC four times. Is he Australian? He definitely gets that a lot. No, he's he's not Australian. No. Why do I think he's Australian? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He, um, he, uh, oh yeah, he's a big finance guy now because he hates crypto. He hates crypto. Yep. Yeah. How's it going these days? (laughs) Yeah, right? How's that going? It's a little tough when Bitcoin's at 70,000. Wait, did Joe and Tracy host it? No, who was Joe was on my team, by the okay. way, not to brag, but okay. um, no, it's the FT, no? FT, FT, yeah, oh, Financial FT, Times. FT, so yeah. it was Robin Wigglesworth. Robin Wigglesworth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, shout out to those guys. How did your team do? Oh, this is a whole thing. We didn't, so for everybody who's listening, so the pub quiz, you have two rounds of trivia where you're writing the trivia in. And it's all like economic, financial, economic, markets. financial. These are nerds. Really also hard questions. Also a little yeah. bit of like English nerdery. Yeah, yes. that's true. Because yes. it's the Financial Times. Yeah. But this year, there was a separate uh, kind of like round that happened throughout the quiz where they gave you nine charts that you had to identify. And then they gave you some like picture puzzles and you had to guess Wait, they what They gave company. you unlabeled charts and you had to say what the chart is? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. And, Karen, let me ask you a favor with a okay. you. Sorry, that was English. <laughs> <so horrible. laughs> that was, oh, wow. I get it. I get it. You show, added some what color. A show, what a what a show, show. Stopper. Okay, but I want to be very clear. So- Sam Rowe, Joe Wiesenthal, John Carney, like they've all been a part of the team that's basically run the table at these yes. quizzes. And we had these uh, charts and these like picture puzzles beside us, but we didn't realize we had to do them throughout the rounds. Mm. So the second round of trivia finished and the FT was like, turn in your papers. And we were like, oh, oh my oh, God. Hadn't even started. We hadn't even started. So we got them all wrong. Because you're in a rush. Uh, well, yeah, I, we were just I, like, I call cap we on that story. Turn. I call cap. <laughs> Did what? you hear them I announce that? I they were no, just, they were just—they were sitting much. there on the table, like it was right. very obvious. And then there was a Our thing on your sheet. It. There was a thing on the sheet of like, here are the answers for this part of the quiz. So like, who won, who's, who won? Biggest nerd on earth? Who was the the big yeah, winner? Who did win? I mean, who you on not? your team won? It was. Oh, you guys won? No, 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 we didn't win. We oh, were okay. we were seventeenth out of thirty four. Oh, okay. oh, oh, we were nineteenth, and we didn't answer it. You're nineteenth. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Listen, we still beat you. Yeah. I mean, we were we were doing really well, but it was. I can't remember which team won. Yeah, I don't remember which team. So won. So I was yeah. I was on teams with like uh, so so I they would like not listen to me until it was something about the stock market. That was like my <laughs> yeah. only value to the conversation. That yeah. was my role on the team, right? Which so, is fine. So they'd be like, "Who was the third Fed president in Minnesota?" No, period. <laughs> like yeah. from 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 uh, yeah, the- 1927. And I would just sit there quietly, you know, pounding. Linda B. Johnson. <laughs> just drink, just drinking. <laughs> and then there'd be like some question about like uh, Apple's market cap. And I would just cl- like physically clear everybody away. <laughs> like, get out of the God, way. This is my moment. This yeah. is me. This is my big moment. All right. We had an eclipse this week. What are the best ETFs to buy after an eclipse? Anyone? Yeah, Callie. No? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> why, was, why were people carrying on about this eclipse this year more than uh, usual, do you think? That's a great question. Do you have yeah, you, do you have that impression? People no, people traveled for this eclipse. People yes. went to the like, Finger Lakes to see an eclipse. Yeah, it went yeah. to like not touristy places to watch this eclipse. I was, it was crazy. I was underwhelmed. I loved it. You uh, yeah, loved I was, the eclipse. I was not. I'm <laughs> actually with you. I'm with you, my guy. Like, I, I thought it was cool. I went out there. I had the glasses. Like, you know why? Because I was like, this is dumb. And then I tell them the go- put on the goggles. I was like, oh shit, this is cool. Yeah, yeah like you guys are really cool. Because I put no investment into it. Same. One of the reporters. I poo-pooed it. Had the had some gl- glasses, so we went out there. We looked. Oh, cool. All right, dope. Bad. All right, I'm gonna tell you a couple things. The first is taking kids out of school early because there's an eclipse. They did that with your kids, right? Yeah. What the hell? Oh, the going- schools did. Well, my wife. What did. the hell is my going wife on? Did. Oh, my wife okay. Did. Why? Because she didn't want it to be on the bus looking up. Like seriously? L- serially. Okay. Yeah. I looked directly at the eclipse. Josh stared at the sun. How are your eyes? And, and he didn't blink. <laughs> not only did I not the put the glasses lost. on, I put on binoculars. I looked <laughs> right at binoculars. it. You did binoculars. That's like right a Chuck Norris it. joke. Chuck Norris stared at the eclipse <laughs> and the, the sun. So I was with people today at lunchtime. This guy's telling me he went to, or somebody he knew went to Vermont. 
to see mm-hmm. the. I'm like, dude, I saw it from a Five Guys parking lot, in between ordering and getting my my uh, salad, and I five was five guys, huh? yeah. Uh, I was just thoroughly underwhelmed. I don't know, Duncan. Uh, you're an eclipse, are you an eclipse guy? I, I actually didn't even have glasses. So did yeah. you even know there was? I didn't an have glasses. I knew either. there I was. I knew there was. I tried to take some photographs. I didn't get anything good though. Uh, yeah, oh, you can't take photos. It's, it's rough. But yeah. no, nah, I had the glass. Maybe it's because you didn't have the glass. Maybe that's uh, why listen, you were impressed. Listen, that's enough with the inflate with the pub stuff and the eclipse stuff. People are here for uh, for some market stuff. So let's okay, get let me right. give you some edge on the eclipse, like for real, for real. <laughs> so apparently, the S and P five hundred. So S and P five hundred stocks. Put them all together. The trading volume in S and P five hundred stocks was the lowest since Black Friday. During the actual. So eclipse. like volume actually dropped off. So the algorithms like watching eclipses. <laughs> I guess so, or the humans that are still oh, present are. That's, that's, that's a big drop. Let me say, huh. that's yeah. noteworthy. That's yeah, a yeah. Drop. Which so is it, incredible, but it makes sense. I mean, if you're stepping away from your computer. Someone's got to push the button. Right, mm-hmm. Someone's got to push the button. They got to beep. So people were like, I'm going to take off a little risk just in case this eclipse gets out of hand. Well, it also <laughs> wasn't a crazy day in markets. It was the yeah. S&P's eighth smallest, intra- eighth smallest intraday range of okay. the year. Okay. It was a boring day. Nobody um, cared. Inflation. People have better things to do, like watch the eclipse. Watch the eclipse. Yeah. So we got a we got a a hot CPI. I would call it hot. I thought, yeah, it's hot. hot. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a bunch to say about this because I didn't get to do my live stream. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's go. Let's go. Three, uh, three and a half percent in March. Uh, February was three point two percent. We're going in the wrong direction, right? Clearly. And I know you can pull things out of it and you can adjust it and blah blah blah. But still. We're still printing three and a half percent CPIs. It's like in and, and of itself, the market does not love this. And the trajectory is up. Yes. I have been really surprised that the market has not reacted more strongly. Like we had that day. The bond market did. The bond market had, yeah, yeah, yeah. the bond market always. But I mean, even that was like 10, 15 basis so points. So the two year had a huge move. Like it, but I'm surprised the stock market did. But, really, that's, but even yeah. like 15 basis points, if we're, re, if we're throwing out Fed rate hikes, which- For um, the year. For the year, right? Yeah. Which Torsten Slot came on the podcast from Apollo. And back March 17th, he was like, I think no rate cuts this year. And I was like, oh shit, hold up. Yeah, yeah. That's a hot take. Yeah. And that was a hot take. But I think I was like, I see your reasoning there. He broke it down. Um, but it, it's like, I don't, you know, the market came in six or seven, right? And then so we've sort of gotten to a place where it's like three. And now it's like two. Like, market is still pricing in two if you look at Fed funds futures. But I really think zero is a legitimate possibility. I think the Fed is trying to get the market to think like, yo, zero could really be the thing. The stock market doesn't believe it. Stock market doesn't believe And I'm like, why? But why, though? It seems like it should. And I I just, I'm wondering if it's just because this is another thing Torsten talked about was this AI thing. Maybe that's just stronger than everything, right? Mm-hmm. This idea that we are refastening or re, reformatting the economy around AI, and that's going to provide such a a massive tailwind to everything so that if, nothing else if, matters. So if they don't cut in June and they cut in July, so what if AI is going to do what we think it's going to do? No, 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 it's not if they don't cut in June and they cut in July. It's they don't cut in June or July or October or November. But I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying, but if but if earnings are growing way faster than expected, that should dominate the no cut. I, yeah, I mean, that seems to be what it is. But I mean, like the Fed is everything. And I feel like somehow we've forgotten that. But maybe they're not. What, no, did, no, you, what did you think when you saw that, <laughs> when you saw that hot print? Were you like freaked out about it or? Me? I never get freaked out. Okay. I'm, I'm very objective. Good. But I That's have a, a few things response. to say. So first of all, Fed's dual mandate is unemployment and inflation. So they don't care about earnings. They don't care about stock prices. I'm very much a Fed truther in that way. Okay. Uh, yes, the CPI report was really hot. If you look at super core inflation, so CPI mm-hmm. inflation, taking rent out, taking energy prices what's super, out. What's what's in super core or what's not in it rather? So what's in, okay. So what's not in it, yeah. rent prices, Rent prices and energy services, basically. Okay. Energy services go up and down a lot. So it's based inflation, on the price X inflation. It's core services minus housing. It's okay. it's the kind of inflation the Fed can control really well. That's why it You know matters. what's so funny? The type of inflation that pisses people off is the worst it's ever been, other than food. Like, uh, maybe not year over year on something like gas prices, but gas prices are moving up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, think about it. Health insurance. Yep. Mm-hmm. Car insurance. Car insurance yes. This is the stuff that really makes people angry. I mean, rent. Rent is still going up at a blistering rent, pace. Right. Yeah. So it's like the it's the it's, it's the inflation points that really bother people. Yeah. And, the thing. So I just want to. Whenever I think about inflation, too, like yes, I want to be clear that inflation is a problem in our lives. Like yes, the pace of inflation is coming down, but 
you will probably never pay cheaper prices than what you're paying today. That will never change. The way that the economy heals is that wages pick up, which is what we're seeing right now. And suddenly your paycheck stretches a little bit further, but that takes time. So that's such a great meme, what you just did though. You know, the meme where Homer Simpson's talking to Bart Simpson and Bart Simpson's like, I just had the worst day of my life. And Homer goes, yet, the worst <laughs> day of your life, yet, son. Like that's uh, a like, I haven't seen that meme. You, you might not like the prices today, but they're the Wait. lowest prices you'll ever pay. <laughs> the yeah, ever yeah. Be. You're gonna love these prices in five years. Is that what five you're years are gonna wish for these prices. <laughs> well, but I say that to say that I understand. I, I'm a human. I I understand the struggle of inflation, and I don't want to poo-poo it at all. But the way that the Fed looks at it is the super core measure. Powell has said that. Every single time he's been public, this is how I look at inflation. This is what we base policy on. We can't control gas prices. Like, come on. That's mm-hmm. a supply thing. That's supply and demand. Right. So there's the Fed's view of inflation, and that plays into rate cuts, rate hikes. And then there's also the, like, daily lives, you know, that inflation really sucks. Prices really suck. Things are still broken. Yeah. The populist inflation. But here's the other thing about the Fed is, and I haven't heard anyone say this, and I was going to say this, but, like, I think we're now talking about not only no rate cuts. We could be talking about rate hikes. Well, that's that's a game changer. Right? For I that. think and the bar is really changer. high for that. But that's I, I see. I don't think so. Again, scary. because infl- it's we were at, we're at three one, then it's three two, then it's three five. Like things are clearly moving in one direction, and it's they've it's been over expectations the past four months. So yeah. every time economists have come in and they've kind of been like, okay, it's gonna be it's gonna fall under three percent. Nope, over three percent. Uh, it's gonna be down to around three percent. Nope. Now we're back up to three and a half. And again, gas prices are moving up consistently. There's a clear line. You see gas prices, auto insurance, home insurance. Um, what's the other big one? Rents have rents were expected to start pulling down CPI yeah. for a long time. Medical's another one. And yeah, medical's not, like everything. They got that, shocked by apparel this month. They can't figure it out. There was, and there, right, it just keeps being more things. Like, I bought a baseball glove, my bad. That was, <laughs> yeah, Michael, Mark stop buying baseball it. gloves. No, but it's generally the trend on all these things is going in one direction. And I, I think there should really be a serious consideration of like, well, not only is the Fed not going to cut, maybe the Fed might have to start talking That's about- instant stock market correction. Yeah, for sure. That's Over, like I'm, overnight. Look at this. So we're looking at a chart. This is from Bloomberg. The US CPI month over month annualized diffusion indexes. So they're looking at the weight of share of CPI components. And there's a line that shows things that are going down. So under zero. So things that are right. where the price is going down. Deflating. N- deflating. Deflation. And yeah. that's remained, that's gone sideways. So there's no more or no less things that are going down. But if you look at the basket of things that are rising over 4% month over month, it's ugly. It's going in the wrong direction. It's uh, rising. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly the, like, that chart from 2024 is kind of exactly the oil chart. It's kind of exactly like, it's all these things and they're just moving in that direction. Did PPI bail us out today? So all, all this, like as of, t- it's Thursday afternoon, everything kind of reversed positive today. We've repaired a lot of the damage from yesterday. A little bit of small cap bounce, a little bit of regional bank bounce. Semiconductors gained back some ground because you got a cooler than expected producer price index, which I know is like less important. But like today, it's it seems, input, though. seems like good, good enough. Yeah. And, and it, I want to be clear, too. The Fed cares about PCE. Yes, CPI right. is the report that everybody loses their minds about. And yes, you should watch it. It's a big market mover type of report. But the Fed is watching PCE. That's what their target is based on. And there is a difference between PCE and CPI. The baskets sure. are different. The weightings are different. So that's the other thing, too. It's it's. But, I got to see the PCE report. But core PC has been right around 3% too. And if that starts, again, that's been pretty consistently just sort of holding. It's the last this mile. That's tough. Yeah. That's, that was the thinking before. But again, now CPI is clearly going up. If PCE starts picking up, and I think this PCE report is going to be really big because – I think when is that? that? Oh, I forgot. We don't have a calendar. <laughs> end of the month. I think it's, it's the twenty eighth, twenty ninth. Okay. Um, but, I agree with you. But that's yeah, a, that's going to be that that's going to be, be a, a big deal, right? If that comes in hot and over three, yeah, on the core side, like that is. What's the big difference between P, uh, CPI and PCE? The, uh, the shelter component is is very different from mm-hmm. one to the other. Yeah, I think the shelter weight is more for PCE. Yeah. Maybe don't quote me no, on no, that. No, no, shelter is uh, less, less for PC. Yeah, which is why it's been not lower. to do another pub quiz. Just uh, I know, I know. <laughs> it's, no, so I, I know this because it's the third of CPI and it's less of PC. What's the best yeah. theory? What's the best theory you guys have for why? Um, all right, let's hope. Let's hope you're wrong that we're gonna about to put rate hikes back on the table. Let's let's. I think some let's assume it's premature. Although I I I agree. It's like if that were to happen, it would it would have a huge impact. But let's let's hope that doesn't happen. 
Um, but what's your best theory for why, even if it does happen, rate hikes really haven't done anything to the consumer, uh, anything noticeable in the aggregate? Yeah. So yeah. What, I'd love I'd love to hear like either your own idea or the best idea you've heard as to why that's the case. Well, our wallets are less and less sensitive to rates because. I mean, I know not everybody owns a house, but a we lot have of people to have fixed in mortgages this, in this under- conversation. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So CoreLogic data. I think it says 70 or 80% pe- of people have fixed mortgage rates under 4%. Right. And I mean, mm-hmm. that was a that was a product of the low rate environment that we've been through. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but the Fed has fewer and fewer lev- levers to pull to control the consumer. Yeah. And again, also not saying that rate uh, rates are not affecting the consumer. They certainly are. But- you know, we're just less sensitive to rates than ever. And that's true for corporate America too, to be fair. What do you think? For sure. I This is a question I've been thinking about for a long time and I haven't found a good answer. I I do think, I mean, I, I think, Mike, you talked about this on uh, my podcast uh, or my former podcast, um, but there is this thing where people do keep spending. And we've I've seen data that shows like the bottom two quartiles of income have had negative savings like the past six quarters. So literally they're spending more than they're making. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing across the board like decreases. You're seeing, you know, increases in things like delinquencies, but not the like, you know, you're 90 days behind. You're, those things have still stayed put. And so there really just hasn't been this reaction that you'd think there would be, especially considering how low consumer confidence is, especially considering, you know, gas prices are going up, all that. And I, I don't know. It is kind of crazy. Callie, what Callie points out about the, you know, the housing part of it, because that's a lot of people's biggest expense, that's been mostly fixed. But there, it really has just blown my mind that you have not seen people. The world has changed. Like the world out. has changed, and people hate to hear that this time it's different. Um, but uh, you know, I think I don't know if it was you or Ben, but somebody wrote a blog post about experts of a. Earlier version of the world. Experts on an earlier version of the world. Mm -hmm. Like there are people who could tell you chapter and verse, here's what happens the last six times the Fed raised rates. Yeah. Here's what it did to stock prices, bond prices. Here's how long it took for the economy to bottom, employment, mortgages. None of that stuff seemed to have applied this time. And the world is, the world has changed. And that also, I think that gets to my thought about a Fed rate hike. Okay. Because consumers are still spending jobs. That's the other thing. The jobs market still hot. 330K uh, last month. So all those things are happening in a world with five and a half percent interest rates. It, what's 575? Yeah. The yeah. Fed has never been cutting interest rates with like college employed unemployment is like 1% right now. Yeah. But historically, okay, the that's Fed a good has thing. Not Let's cut, be clear. We want right, a But historically, the Fed has not cut interest rates into an environment like that. Also, PMIs. Now that PMIs are back positive, the Fed yeah. doesn't cut rates when PMIs oh, are, point too. are strengthening, right? Yeah. All um, these things are happening. Did you read this thing from Matt Klein at the overshoot, Mike? I did not. Okay. <laughs> so he was trying to answer this question. Why have rate hikes not done anything? And I thought he uh, he did a really good piece. And he's about consumer behavior around rates. Um, a good swath of Americans are benefiting from higher rates. Yeah. So this is something that I've I've talked about just in the in terms of like how much money their cash is earning and how that mm-hmm. makes them feel. Mm-hmm. Um, Shout 80%, out 5% money market accounts. So, so 80% uh, of people with a fixed mortgage rate under 4%. That's great. Um, investors have more flexibility than ever to chase higher income. Okay, this is important. It used to be that you didn't move money from one bank to another really easily. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's just, it was not a thing. There was no internet uh, in prior rate hike cycles. Like literally, there, yeah. w- there was not internet banking in 2004. There was no blockchain. 2005. <laughs> no, seriously though, there's no fintech. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah, if, yeah. if you were unhappy with the rate that your bank was paying you in 2005, it was like, all right, well, that sucks. I don't want to fill out paperwork. You have yeah. to literally drive around. So, okay. The so, the, so the flexibility, yeah. I think, is underrated. Uh, and people are chasing these rates. We know. I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. Chaser. And uh, the awareness around rates is higher than ever. Everybody knows. Well, not everybody. But it's it's now a thing to talk about the high rate on – Yeah, what you're um, getting. On – why am I blinking? The save the series the series savings whatever. Oh, I bonds. I am uh, yes, I bonds. I bonds. I'm having a break. That was that was to this day that was the highest like most clicks I've gotten on an article. But the everybody about talked I-bonds. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Nine yeah. percent yield on I bonds. I had friends coming to me asking me if I should set up an should LLC buy to, buy mm. to buy more I bonds. To buy more. And I was they like, definitely heard about I bonds on TikTok. 
Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's a, the rate sensitivity there, yes. it, or the rate awareness. Because yes, our wallets are, are very. What sensitive. What do we do with car insurance? What do we do about car insurance? Wait, wait, can we show the video? That can we just get the? Because oh. I want to. <laughs> I, I, I feel really like this is a great segue. Where, where, I really want to show this. Video. Video. How do we? How do we? See I this? just sent it to the email thread. Um, oh, okay. So it's it's right, in well, there somewhere. Well, well, jo- yeah, pull that up, Josh. Well, you pull that is up. John, just, is John like in this, the email thread? Because I can't pull it up. Because this is I sent it to everyone on the email thread, so you should have gotten it. It's the last email from me. All right, but um, I will I can fill while you know, we just while do it you live. Find this. Just do it live. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> live. Just do it live. There's a B. There's, really. there's, there's a whole it. thing. Yeah, 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 this Unc Sam, man. I hear y'all out here, y'all buying crypto, y'all buying meme stocks again like Tupperware, y'all buying JGB, listening to the ECB, and y'all ain't buying AI stocks, you don't know nothing about AI, that's why you're losing money, that's why your portfolio is in the red, oh, of course. y'all need to learn about these bonds, treasury bonds, my bonds, paying over 5%, my bonds, money from the government, my bonds. What you know about real yields? My bonds, <laughs> treasuries. I can't believe they let you do this. I can't either. My bonds, real, all the mother state uh, counting treasury. We are real yields highest since the two thousand. We are getting we'll word get from uh, yeah. Jason's Zweig. He is leaving the Wall Street Journal now. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he, he wasn't aware that this happened. And uh, See, can I tell you, Zweig loved it. Swag's the best. Swag is my guy. Swag, Swag is. is my guy. I love Swag. All right. So, what did you want to? What did you want to tell us besides your uh, your skill, your mad skills? My besides showcasing Un- undeniable myself. skills. No, no, I, but that's the it other. Should be part you versus right? Kendrick next. Are you ready for this? Listen, we're, Are you we're ready beefing. for that smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready for this smoke. I got a verse for him. Okay. It's gonna end his career. Um, but no, the thing, the point I was trying to make was. <laughs> I actually think it's the, like not enough people are aware. So this Santander survey just came out and it said, I think it was 75% of people said they would switch if they thought it took under 10 minutes, but they're not. Switch for what? A higher, a higher, higher yield rate, on their cash. Right? And they, I think there was a, there was a bank rate survey. And I, I wish I could remember the numbers, but it's something like, I don't know. 50% of people are still getting less than 3%. And actually the amount of money, like interest-bearing deposits in the big five banks, like JPM, yeah. uh, you know. It's getting zero, is, there's trillions. Is getting, yeah. it's, it's more, it's increased over the last yeah. year, year or two, right? So there's more people still getting zero for their savings in this era of like 5%. Because I think over 15 years, people have become conditioned to right. feel like this, and it's not worth it. Now it's worth it. It's absolutely. But there's worth it. so much inertia in life. Like p- things, p- think about it. People it's paying hard, gym yeah. memberships that don't show up. Think about like right. it's just a lot of inertia. So this is another form of that. It so, is, but it's. I think it's easier now than it's ever been, and that's great. why I wanted to do that video was to just like make something people say, "Oh yeah, I should." Did people? Get did this people free say money? that like, "Oh, I wasn't going to move my money," but then, but then I saw this rap there, video. So then I saw Uncle Sam in the <laughs> trap. Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the um the background on my Twitter post is this comment on that video that goes, Yo, this song slaps, I'm gonna buy some bonds. <laughs> oh. There we go. Love uh, it. Hey, I wanna won. give I wanna give Neil Dutt of the final so you word. Saved, you saved one Wait, guy. Wait, can I, I say one, one thing before ahead. you go? Go ahead. So I think both can be true. I think that investors can be more aware than five percent rates in ev- than ever, but there's also a subset that has no idea, doesn't care, just wants to stay. That inertia part that Josh yeah. talked about. But so we did a survey on the City Toro, and this blew my mind. We basically asked people, you know, are you piling up cash? Do you own more cash now than you did three months ago? Why are you piling up cash? And then we kind of sliced the demographics out of it. Oh, and why? what would force you to take cash out and put it somewhere else? Right. And younger investors by far said that I'm piling up cash. I'm doing it for the rate. And I would love to reinvest it one day when I feel better about the stock market, mm. which isn't great. But blew my mind because younger investors too in the survey were more optimistic about the economy, more optimistic about their investments, more mm. optimistic about their job prospects. That's good though. But I mean, that's people, great. But you're saying yeah. they're staying in cash rather than investing that in the market. That's Is a that, weird dichotomy. That's not great, but they are being opportunistic around these 5% rates because it's okay. 5% rate. Do they buy that 2% dip? Yeah. The boomers are not going to, the boomers are not going to panic enough to give them that opportunity. That they all think they're gonna get. Yeah, it's it's startling to watch. The boomers just will not panic sell their their stocks anymore. It's almost as if forty years of conditioning have taught them not to do that. Yeah, and they refuse. That's that's the other thing about this. It's right? interesting. Like, I I think again, even if there are, you know, we start to hear about Fed rate hikes. I don't know that that's even going to kill this rally because there just is so oh, much. The animal it spirits, will. the animal will. spirits for a hot four so hours. Will for sell. a hot four hours, right? <laughs> no, it will kill this rally. Um, all right, Neil Dada. He, here's what he said when inflation came in out. He said, "Yes, actual inflation was a setback today, but it is important to go to first principles. Wage growth is cooling. 
and returning to something resembling normal. The Atlantis Fed median wage tracker eased to 4.7% in March, the weakest since December 2021. If wage growth is cooling and price inflation is rising, we ought to be less concerned about runaway inflation and somewhat more concerned that consumers begin making trade-offs, cutting back on spending. That, in turn, will weigh on prices. He's a he's a uh, dovish. Like, Dada is a guy telling you, no, 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 we're still on track to see inflation this, come down. This is the shit. I used to, yeah, I showed that chart. I'm, I'm all pointing, the time I'm pointing to the wage growth. Explain the, explain wage the chart, growth. Michael. So, wage growth peaked in 2000, what is that, 21? 21, 21, 21. And it's heading the right direction, which is lower. And this ultimately well, is the what right direction for whom, Michael? Well, true. Drives yeah. this, this drives, this is the sticky part. And there's a lot of yeah. other sticky parts. So I'm not hand waving anything. But if we zoom out, this is the thing. And yeah, it's, this and it's is still the chart. falling. Yeah. I agree. But Going like, back to the Fed cares about unemployment, the job market, and inflation. They're trying to balance the seesaw here. This is a chart that shows us that they're correctly balancing the seesaw. And I agree. Like, we, we want to get a 7% raise over a 4% raise. Come on. But also, wages, when they're growing that hot, they become a risk to the economy. You By know. the way, no, look, when the peak of wage growth was, were mm. people happy then? No, they were miserable. No. No. And they're still they miserable. talking about supply chains and <laughs> eggs. Stagflation. Yeah. Let's not act like we weren't here. The hot button. Three years ago, people were pissed. Yeah, I'm not advocating Whoa. for like lower raises here. I'm just saying we need to get this back in balance. Yeah, because when that we are. when that was happening, inflation was at like nine. Though. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And you don't want inflation over wage. I think growth. people no. want fast wage growth, just not for anyone other than themselves. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yes. That's so this right. is this is the this is truth. I want to I want to go back to auto insurance because this really grinds my gears. L -L -L. I am, well, I'm paying for multiple people in my in my home yeah, now. That's tough. I don't even understand what the hell this is based on. What? Uh, why? I think it's the we can principle. But why would this go up twenty percent in a year? What the f is that? Because we can room to run. But are there I, see, I see no resistance. Are there twenty? Are there twenty percent yeah. more fatalities on the road? I heard a, a good a theory year? around this. Okay. So. Hit me. And this is not from me. I read it from a much smarter economist. But you heard it from uh, the Geico lizard. From the Geico lizard. Shout right, out, Geico. Go uh, <laughs> uh, I read a really good take on this um, around the number of cars that have been ruined by natural disasters. And oh, I don't know really? if this is Climate real change. or true, but apparently that impacts, uh, of course, it impacts auto insurance sure. rates. and. It's it's had like a bigger bigger impact recently, but I was like, oh, what a okay. crock of shit! They, no, they're it's not a natural disasters. No, it's, it's not definitely a crock of shit, because property casualty rates are also up through the roof yeah. uh, year over year, and there's a huge climate uh, uh, impetus behind that. Like so I it's think not, it's one reason. It's not like right. there's earthquakes in New York. <laughs> okay. No, was, I, I want. There you go. That the was, reinsurers okay. set the rates yeah. for property casualty I mean, yeah. that the insurers then are forced to pay. Right. Who then turn around and hit us with it? And are there climate, margins? Not, are there margins not increasing? Climate is disastrous for reinsurance, and therefore the premiums have. To How go much up. are they taking to the bottom line? Like, Who? The, the, not none. It depends. Not none. Auto right? insurance? I don't think they make that much money. You don't think their margins are increasing uh, with this rise? Of course they are. Come on. They yeah. will temporarily, and then they'll compete each other to death on, I mean. Uh, in, a, in a free market, yes. Okay. There are insurance companies pulling out of states. <laughs> pulling out of states. Yeah. yeah. State Farm denied coverage to 72,000 customers yeah. in California. Not auto, property casualty, but for the same reason. Yeah. There are uneconomical insurance policies out there. I'm not, look, I'm not crying for insurance companies, believe me. It's not what I'm, I'm saying the opposite. Mm -hmm. But I am making the point that, like, I don't think they're having that much fun. Just by virtue of being able to raise rates is not necessarily great for them. No, but I do think it, the point Michael's making is, like, a little bit of this is on the margin. Oh, no, I, a lot of it. And yeah, sure. and I don't know that I'm I'm You're guessing assuming. somebody will fact check us. And it's but. I think it's again, it gets back to that difference between CPI and PPI, right? Like yeah. CPI or PPI has been right around one percent. So you think so. A, a lot? So what percentage of a twenty two percent rise in auto insurance year over year is greedflation? That's yeah, and that's a great question. Ten percent, nineteen, no, thirty percent. So so <laughs> I remember I remember percent, like two years I ago. <laughs> I remember two years ago and shout out to corporate America. One of the home builders was asked, what are they doing to prices now that lumber has come way down? And he said, oh, we're taking that to the market. We're taking that to the bottom line. Yeah. yeah. Prices don't come down. I bet, ever. I bet the stock price. But this, uh, no, it's good for investors. John. But it sucks for policyholders, which is all of us. Impact yeah. of auto insurance on US CPI year over year percentage. It's wild. Yeah. So explain this chart. So 
the what we're looking at is the auto insurance contribution, and it mm. started at a very low rate, and now it's ha- now it's fifty six basis points. It's a lot. That's significant. It's it's fifty six out of the three forty seven. It's a lot. And yeah. one of the stories I did last year was about who's most affected. It's these middle class families, right? Because it's people living in the suburbs who have two cars and right? kids, they drive maybe. In and kids, right? But it's so you know what is it? It's gas. It's auto insurance. It's all these things that are affecting largely suburban, largely middle class people. Like, and that's that's who's hitting it the most. So I actually had, in this story I showed how m- the middle class is actually getting hit the most by this rise. And in that inflation. was an opera. I'm, that was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In 2015. Auto insurance was a negligible percentage of CPI. Right now, it's 56 basis points out of three and a half percent. Even in yeah. 2021, it was nothing. Out of 350 Even basis in 2021, so it was nothing. So if yeah. you were to pull this auto insurance contribution out of this number, are, are we at two and a half? We're are we at three. Uh, three percent in inflation or, or under? Yeah, we're under. We're under three. I'm Let's just pull it all out. Pull, can we just pull that out? Just take it out. Hard. Can we just take it? Well, the frustrating thing, if you think back to the Fed, I was talking about super core inflation, the kind that they care about. This is in services, mm-hmm. but it makes you think. Like, and like Jay Powell is much smarter than me. But oh, I mean, auto this, insurance is not in autos. It's well, it's not in durable goods. It's it's in services. Exactly. Yeah. So there are these like idiosyncratic factors going on where it's not just supply and demand. Nothing is ever easy, but like this in a weird way is like what the Fed is watching and saying, like, I could squash this. But it right. sounds like an industry specific thing. Right. I don't know how you squash this. I don't know how you let's do let's let's keep moving. Manufacturing is back. Woo! Baby. You mentioned an ISM yeah. manufacturing activity is growing for the first time in two years. Yeah. Yep. Say more. I will say the one caveat I'll put on this, and then I'll let Callie go, but like the Chicago PMI, which is the heartland sort of manufacturing Mm. industry, has been negative, I want to say 18 the last 19 months. Last month, I want to say it was like 44, which is decidedly below that 50 break even point. They lying? So, so that's, no, I just think that's a thing to watch. This is this is good news, what happened in manufacturing last month. And it's great that manufacturing is back. But that Chicago PMI number for folks getting excited about this PMI thing, that manufacturing has come back, is worrisome, I think. This is a yeah, survey. It's a I, regional story, and that's not great. ISM is, yeah. ISM is a survey. And that's ISM the heartland. Is a survey. So Chicago, they might be upset about all their shit. They, well, it's the Chicago PMI. So That's it's what, just, it's uh, the Midwest, basically. How's yeah. the Midwest doing? And like, not good. Is the yeah, answer. well, the Cubs well, aren't doing good. But what we yeah. keep, what we keep <laughs> learning is Bears. that people feel, <laughs> yeah. people, the feels are worse than the facts. So is that distorting this, these surveys a little bit? You can, yeah. And that's why some folks don't like things like PMI, you know, these sort of soft data surveys. But 18 out of 19 months is a thing. It's a lot. And NFIB small business optimism has been negative, or not negative, but has been below its historical average for, I want to say, 20-something months at this point. Yeah. Um, if I had a computer in front of me, I could actually tell you the numbers. But there are all these things that are showing, like, there's just a lot of stress. And yes, this number going back positive is solid, and it's a thing you can point to. But there is just a lot of angst. There's a lot of angst, but also and a lot this of is like noisy too. This could go positive and then negative the next month. Yeah. But that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, it doesn't trend. Chicago PMI is negative 18 out of 19 months. Yeah. And that's a thing. Yeah. So I think if you're an investor and you're looking at sectors, this is incredibly important. Taking what Josh said, like this is this is a survey. It could go back and forth. It is trending upward. So like 50, of course, is the line where yeah. between manufacturing is getting better and manufacturing is getting worse. Right. And for the longest time, I think 14 months, it's been getting worse, but less and less worse over the past few months, if that makes yeah. any sense. It's the rate of, it's the direction, right? Uh, yeah, so now manufacturers feel better. The suppliers are saying, oh, okay, like I feel great. We expect you know more orders to come in the pipeline. And that pushed the soft survey above 50. I mean, I think we should consider that when cyclicals have been just absolutely trounced over the past year. And the talk has all been around big tech, baby. And, you know, big tech is leading the market, but nothing else is. This, to me, speaks speaks about a rotation, which we've seen yeah. over the past few weeks. Josh, but that's not true. What's that? What's the... What's the custodial? Oh, Mike's <laughs> trying to fact check. <laughs> no, no, Real no. time fact What's check. What's the company that manufactures <laughs> uh, gear? Like we were saying about like custodial gear. Oh, CTAS. Is that it? Cintas. Yeah. Stocks on fire. Yeah. Oh this, yeah, yeah. The this stocks is, are killing. This so is the economy. Mean the costume uh, company. Costume company. Yeah, they Not make costume, they make costumes for workers. Uh, ADP. 
Okay. Is another one. Does that look like anything other than holy cow, that's great news? No, no. So, okay. So we had look at the, that chart. We had the CEO of Ferguson on this episode of the podcast that's never going to be. Turd air Ferguson? Because, <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, not Turd Ferguson. But we had the CEO on the episode that's never going to air. So I think I can talk about it. Um, and he's like, yeah, you know, our stock is on fire. They're up 70% over the past year. Up, mm. I think like almost what are they, 20. What, are they, what does Ferguson it, do? Ferguson is like um, piping. It's it's all the stuff or basically home remodels, construction, like yeah, yeah, all yeah. that stuff. All those so, stocks look amazing. Yeah, look incredible right now. And so I was like, but so what are you seeing? It's like, well, honestly, ah, I don't know. This big manufacturing boom that's supposed to be coming, right? Because, and actually, again, to go to the podcast, but I interviewed Joe Biden's CEA chief, right? And he's like, it's coming. It's yeah. coming. We, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS Act, all those things put a bunch of money out into the manufacturing sector that's supposed to be bringing parts. It takes and, time because it, 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 multi- it, it multiplies. That's the exactly spend, what the, the, There has to be a velocity of that money and you have to feel it in the economy and yeah. eventually you will. And so what the-, the And CEO, then we'll really get inflation. <laughs> and then, yeah. <laughs> but what the CEO was saying, he was like, look, there's all these jobs out there. We right now can't find people to fill them because we've got to kind of- recreate that supply of workers. And so we can't really get a lot of this stuff going because there just aren't people who have trained for that. Everyone went to liberal arts college to, you know, get a degree in underwater it's basket very, weaving very or, true. you know, finance yeah. or, <laughs> or journalism. But like, oh. you know, the people aren't, yeah, that, that last one's a bad decision. But my point <laughs> is just that people kind of stopped going to trade school, chop, stopped doing And so there's yeah. just not- We talked to uh, Jason Shu about that. I was, I was asking him like, what are the odds that the United States will really be able to restart semiconductor manufacturing in Arizona? Mm-hmm. And he was very pessimistic because he said it's not that United States can't. It's that do the people want to? Yes. You don't have a million people who want to go work in a clean room for Intel. Right. And nor, nor do we have the people that have that experience because we stopped doing it 25 years yeah, ago. Exactly. We sent that to the Far East. So and now you want a standing st- start. It's really hard. And that's the thing that there there hasn't been that investment of yeah. like trying to get kids Training. excited about going into manufacturing. Like my uh, one of my little cousins uh, just graduated from high school. And I was like, have you thought about the trades? Have you thought about it? He's like, what? Manufacturing? Like, yeah. no, what are you talking yeah. about? You know, it, does, it doesn't even occur. Yeah, he's like, he has no idea what You're he wants to do. He's thinking about it. Like, because it's thinking, always like an afterthought. Right. He's thinking about like for, the army or should I go to like, you know, he's thinking about those kind of things. Yeah. Like this isn't a, a kid who, you know, got a 4.0 GPA, but he's There's like- only one job available for that generation and it's influencer. <laughs> there's no, there's yeah. no other. He's or Amazon other. retailer. Amazon retailer. Um, you, you mentioned that if the manufacturing uh, rally is real, if that's really going to happen- Small over large is the trade. Yeah, so can you pop Let's, up that chart? We have that chart from you, Kyle, Callie. Let's, this is what my colleagues would call a bar chart or barcode chart. That's it. Barcode chart. Okay, oh. so this is a little convoluted. A bar, I'll explain a barcode it chart. It's it pretty like funny. A barcode. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, okay, so I looked at the spread between the Russell 2000, how it performed 12 months following uh, versus the S&P 500 at all these points in time, but I overlaid it against the manufacturing PMI. And as you can see, the thickest bands are around when manufacturing starts to get better. Mm. So small caps perform really well when the economy is ripping, when people want to take risk, they're more manufacturing sensitive and they're more American sensitive too, a domestic mm. economy sensitive. Josh is going, mm, he has no idea what he's looking at. I know exactly <laughs> what I'm looking at. Normally when you see a chart like this, the gray shaded area represents recession. recession yeah. 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 So what I was going to tell you is remake the chart. <laughs> no, no, hear me out. Okay. Remake the chart. But instead of that gray being small caps out, perform large, make it like green. Like That's not a great gray, idea. Make it green. Okay. Yeah. I showed this chart to Todd Sohn, by the way. Okay. We love Shout Todd. Shout out Todd Sohn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We love him. He said the same thing. Yeah, okay. And I'm so, kicking myself now. So I know, not only do I know what I'm looking at, <laughs> I know how to improve it. Oh. Oh. And oh. make the white part. Red. No, or okay. or, or, or the blue line should actually be the gray bars. Or <laughs> or <laughs> apologize. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Okay, but uh, I do want to give a shout out to Trading View because Trading View is awesome. Data's from Trading View. Pierce Crosby, we, shout out. We 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 love Pierce. Um Larry Fink wrote a letter to shareholders this week. I really liked it, and I, I dare say I liked it more than I liked Jamie Diamond's Me letter. Me too. Which mm-hmm. came out the same day. It was more hopeful. It was more upbeat. Jamie Diamond is like Jamie Diamond is like half hopeful, half we're all gonna die. Yeah. 
Larry Fink is like, let me tell you about my parents. Jimmy Donovan's yeah, letter that's, that's, was that's like, we're in a letter. nuclear winter. Yo, but Larry Larry Fink's letter was like, like low key folksy. It was good. I liked it. It was like Buffett esque. I really liked so it. So I'll tell you why I didn't like it. I'm going to be a hater real quick. <laughs> uh, um, as much as get, I love BlackRock. As much as I love BlackRock. No, no it, he didn't say, like, there were no answers. He just said a bunch of things. He's like, you know, we really need to rethink retirement. Okay. Uh huh. You right. who manages ten yeah. trillion dollars, tell us how to do that. Self-serving. Tell us how to do that. Yeah. Check out our advisors. He says multiple times, "I'm not saying I've got a." It was like, bro, you got Bitcoin no Bitcoin ETFs solved. That's <laughs> solved. <laughs> who, Everyone who, just gets who into in Bitcoin our Bitcoin is not going to be retired. Yeah. Um. I, here's what I liked about it. He's he, he ag- agrees with something that I have been saying for the last few weeks. So there's like a there's a vibration in the universe, and both Larry and I are. Picking up the same wavelength. Mm. You're like Godzilla and Kong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what's No, happening. no. Larry and I are on the same page about the fact that maybe it's not the economy we need to focus on if we want a good economy. Maybe it's the stock market and the economy will improve if the stock market is good. Oh, wow. I know it's backwards Petty. and nobody would say that, but Larry is sort of saying that. He's saying capital markets will be the key to addressing the mid 21st century's biggest economic challenges. Yeah. And so the letter, uh, he asked the question, why did the U.S. rebound from 2008 faster than almost any other developed nation? Index funds. Capital markets. Capital markets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Low price. (laughs) Low price. (laughs) High high shares. He says, a big part of the answer is the country's capital markets. In Europe, where most assets were kept in banks, Mm -hmm. economies froze. Banks were forced to shrink their balance sheets. U.S. banks also had to tighten capital standards and pull back from lending but because the U.S. had a more robust secondary pool of money, the capital markets, IVV. the nation was able to recover more quickly. Uh-huh. Is there nothing to that? No, no, no. I like it. I like it. You agree? I, I do. Okay. I, I genuinely yeah. do. Doctor, do you concur? No, no, no. But it was more than that. I was like, not only is it our capital market, it's like, it's not just the banks. Other countries are so heavily reliant on their banks Correct. to right. provide liquidity. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't have the robust capital markets outside of banks that we do in this great country. A, cu- I, a couple of more darts real quick okay. from, from Venk. Today, public equities and bonds provide over 70% of financing for non-financial corporations in the U.S., more than any other country in the world. In China, the bank-to-capital market ratio is almost flipped. Chinese companies rely on bank loans for 65% of their financing. In my opinion, this is Larry, Lawrence, this is the most important lesson in recent economic history. Countries aiming for prosperity don't just need strong banking systems. They need strong capital markets. This lesson is now spreading around the world. So I'm not, I'm not going to read anymore, but he talks India, Japan, all of these countries are getting their stock market shit together. That's the big change. Now in 2017, we all convinced ourselves there was this, we called it synchronized global growth. Mm-hmm. Raise your hand if oh, you I remember. About that. Oh, yeah. Remember yeah, that shit? Remember yeah. that. Well, it didn't work out. <laughs> didn't work out. We had a trade war instead mm-hmm. in 2018. Yeah, we did. But the point is, if countries focus on making their investor class rich, the um, the velocity of that money is how they restore their economy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's the one thing none of them have tried. Europe doesn't give a shit about stocks. <sighs> the Japanese, almost none of them participate in their own stock market. India doesn't yet have that big or rich of an investor class. It's an idea. It's, of course, BlackRock's idea. Right. Yeah. Right. There might be someone self-serving, but it's not crazy. It's not crazy. And, you know, one thing that this made me think about is, well, A, first of all, the uh, the capital markets got us into this position where there is a lot of inequality. Mm, but, there it is. But, Don't do but, that. but Don't that's do that. not me fighting what Larry Fink said or Lawrence. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I, I mean, securitize mortgages. He addresses that, but uh, I'll let you cook. Right, right. But if you think about it in the U.S., we almost have such a competitive advantage. And I I am also not like hanging my hat on this, but we have such a competitive advantage that companies go to the U.S. to IPO. Companies look to us for those capital market for that capital market liquidity. So these days, so I slightly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if the the if anything really shifts there. I, I obviously there are other countries that are, you know, learning more about investing. Stocks are becoming more popular. Other investments are becoming more popular. Um, bonds are a big deal in Italy, by the way. Learn that uh, from our Italian analyst. But- uh, Shout out to Fabrizio. Shout out to Fabrizio. <laughs> Shout out, Fabrizio. <laughs> They're more risk averse. Bottom line, we all yeah. know this. We know that investors all over the world tend to be more risk averse. We've talked to people that say the problem with China 
It's not that they're risk averse. It's that they think of stocks as gambling, not as investing. Mm -hmm. And that's what has to change there. They don't. Uh, yeah. I don't know. What, what do you think about the message? I, I just, I'll throw this out there. It's like, again, the cynical and now unemployed journalist. Um, one who also loves to invest, though. One who also yeah. does love to invest. Right. Yeah. This I've just heard a lot of these speeches before, and they always end with, and that's why now's the time for active management. Okay. <laughs> and, that's, and, and Larry didn't do that here. It didn't happen. You know, he's. I read the whole thing. Oh, <laughs> dude, it's private credits in five. Now's, now's the time for alternatives. And we need you to help our capital markets continue. Right. You to burgeon. And this is why it's a stock picker's market. What's this uh, 2018 BlackRock Commission oh, study of here, here's one thing, Here's one, here's one thing that I, that I pulled out that I thought was interesting. All right. You spoke a lot about retirees and investing. Um, in 2018, BlackRock commissioned a study of 1,150 American retirees. And when we dug into the data, we found something unexpected and even paradoxical. Um, after two decades of retirement, the average person still had 80% of their pre-retirement money saved. Uh, if they had invested, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead here, if they had invested for retirement, they were likely sitting on more than enough money for the rest of their lives. And yet the data also showed that they were anxious about their finances. Only 32% reported feeling comfortable about spending what they had saved. So, so here's, here's the coup de grace. This retirement paradox is a simple explanation. Even people who know how to save for retirement still don't know how to spend it. Oh, I agree with that. And oh, so true. This is a first world problem, but it's real. People have been taught their entire lives to save, to save, to save. Yeah. And when the saving get, gets turned off and it's time to start to spend, there's a lot of anxiety around that. Absolutely. Yep. Well, it's because you don't know. And I, I, I had this conversation with my father, who is retired, has been retired for about, I want to say, 20 years at this point. Oh, and wow. literally, so he moved to Ghana in West Africa, where cost of living, obviously, significantly cheaper. And he, he still, like, he doesn't pay for hot water. Like the man is so cheap, he will not pay the extra charge. What is he saving? To get hot right. Water. So, like, what are you saving? If not but that, then what are you going to spend on? His answer to me actually was in landing. He was like, "Because I don't know how long I'm going to need it." And that's well, he, it's true. he really is thinking like, "I might live to 100, 120." Like this is yeah. you know, and that's the that's what induces that uncertainty and that fear is like, "What if I run out and then I'm a hundred years old and I just I don't have any money?" Mm -hmm. This is crazy though. They people the people are between seventy five and ninety five in this study, and they have eighty percent of their retirement money still that, yeah. in that age group. It's I mean of course yes of course we don't know how long we're gonna need it. And one thing about um, one thing about serving wealth management clients in general, they tend to have better health outcomes, uh, and so the 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 uh, life expectancy doesn't really apply to them in the same way. So you tracks. Right. You talk to the top decile of people in terms of income or net worth or whatever, right. they are not on average living to 75. They're on average going further. Right. Yeah. And if you make it to 75, you have like a very good chance of making it to 90. Right. So like just statistically. Yeah. So it's so it's it's wild though, even given that how much money people are still hanging on to. And we see it in our industry. We see people borrowing money against their portfolio as an alternative to actually having to take the money out of the portfolio. Oh, That's wow. interesting. And, and knock on wood, the S&P is doing 13% a year annualized for a decade, so they can. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. in that environment, you can do that. Mm. Um, but it's 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 really crazy to me. How do we fix it? Uh, well, I mean, the other thing is, if you're 80 years old, what are you spending your money on? Well, like, what are you really going to buy? This, Health if, expenses. If you talk to my financial planners, they will tell you this. these conversations are difficult, but mm. people listen. You say to them, like, what's the thing you really wanted to do? Or we put all these things in your plan. You never did any of them. Yeah. <laughs> it ain't going to be more fun in 10 years. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like at 70, this is going to be fun. At 80, this is going to be a chore. So are you doing it or not? Like the, like those kinds of conversations, which uh, easier said than done. Can you explain this DXYZ shit to me? Um Am I taking crazy pills? We're doing this again? I Do you was going to ask you. No, I definitely can't. Please, no, enlighten me. You have no idea what this is? I have no idea. Did I'm you see it? I'm blissfully ignorant. This might be the craziest meme stock of all time. Oh, come on. Look at a chart. It, it sounds incredibly inefficient. Okay. This is, here it is. Here's the story. Just started trading. It just started trading. It's a closed-end fund. Most people don't know what that is in this day and age because it's mostly ETFs. They don't create or redeem new shares of this. So however many shares there are, that's how many shares there are. It's a net asset value. Right. It has to be a closed-end fund because the underlying is not liquid stocks. It's venture capital, privately held companies. Oh. So people that want to invest in SpaceX and Starlink and all these things, they can't get access to it. This really clever guy 
listed a closed end fund with $50 million worth of private investments. So of course, immediately was worth a billion dollars. Of course. Yeah. Well, because why wouldn't? Because <laughs> why, why wouldn't it, it be? Why wouldn't it be? So it's fifty million dollars worth of private equity, private equity assets being valued at a billion. Uh-huh. It trades from eight dollars to ninety nine dollars, <laughs> like instantly. That's incredible. This makes this makes GameStop look like a joke. Okay. I, okay. I want to give a very analyst perspective here, please. In a sea of cons that we could mention about DXYZ, the. I mean, the pro is this is giving access to an inaccessible market. Uh, They're reaching, Cali. Uh, yeah. Let me, uh, and like I, I believe in that. Like, cap on that. You're it's right. your money. <laughs> you are right. You are right, but. But also I so I stand wrong. for that, but, but also let's so go to the cons. So, all right. I, uh, also, I just like that we could talk about this because to me, the funniest thing that's ever happened is this DJT stock, and I can't talk about that. Yeah, so yeah, we could yeah. talk about this. Uh, Destiny Tech 100 is what it's called. Matt Levine, of course, uh, this this almost this thing was almost invented for him uh, mm, to write yeah. about. So he writes, the portfolio is worth $52.6 million, give or take, or about $4.84 per share. That value is uncertain. You know, obviously the private assets, they get marked every quarter, and it's a bit stale, but it's probably close enough. The stock opened in the direct listing at $8.25. It closed yesterday at $99 per share for a market cap of $1.1 billion. That's a 1,961% premium to net asset value. If every one of the fund's holdings goes up 1,000% by the time they go public, the people who bought into this fund today (laughs) will lose money. Mm. Yeah. So, yes, it's nice to get access to private markets. Uh Maybe not like this. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is this is a bad look. I pay a premium, but- Matt's advice to the guy that founded this. What do you think his advice was? Uh, Callie, what would you guess? What was the question? Matt's advice to the guy that founded this. Oh, I'm reading it right now. <laughs> Get your money. I have no, do advice. another one. No, yeah. Yeah. sell as much stock as you can. Yeah, yeah. Secondary oh. offering immediately. Oh, absolutely. It's yeah, why fr- would you not? It's free money, and it's ar- it's arbitrage. You'll bring the 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 price closer so to the how, actual how, value. How do you explain this? People are f-ing stupid. I've been telling you. I've been <laughs> I'm doing this no, show since 2021. No, no, but people have not suddenly got stupid. Uh, people buying this at 80 don't think that they're getting a deal. They think another asshole is coming along yeah, who will pay 85. Right. The and greater right. It's a meme right. stock, yeah. Right. And uh, that happens until it stops happening. Right. But yeah. that's a game. Yeah. And by the way, if you bought it at 20, 100% above what it's worth, game. you killed it. Yeah. Yeah. So Long we- just sold. Or- speaking of I which- I don't know if many of them sold, but- s- Speaking of which, so. lottery tickets. Yeah. So tell me, tell me what's mm. happening here. All right, so The Economist, did you guys see the story? The Economist yep. said in 2023, Americans spent more than $100 billion on state-run lotteries. That is a lot of money. Wait, in one year? In one year. <laughs> state lottery, these are healthy margins. State lotteries kept around 30% of ticket sales on average. So that's that'll fix the deficit. That'll, yeah, there uh, and they've got a chart showing the ticket sales and government revenue. And it looks like it's just, it looks one way. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. So here, here's here's the upshot. Using zip code level sales data from 24 states, they estimate that each 10% decrease in median household income uh, is associated with a 4% increase in lottery uh, spending. So this is heavily regressive, obviously. Uh, they say age and, and ethnicity were also correlated with lottery sales. Older and non-white Americans are more likely to play. Next chart, please. I mean, this is really wild. So the chart that we're looking at, I'll I'll describe it via text. In the poorest 1% of zip codes that have lottery retailers, the average American adult spends around $600 a year or nearly 5% of their income on tickets. That's unbelievable. Is it really that stupid though? If you think about like, this is their shot. No, the word is, is it irrational? And not really. No, it's not irrational. No, it's not. I would say it's irrational. I I just, I understand it though. Yeah. Because I I live in the Bronx. And so like- People do win. Yeah, like, there's I know no, the odds are not great, but someone does win, yes. Uh, and they usually win a lot of money. You and can't win if you don't I, play. Wait, hold on. Okay, win. I'm sorry. We can't be on a financial <laughs> show like encouraging <laughs> the lottery. No, encouraging no, people to buy lottery tickets. Like, what's idea. the fr- what's the state of the state the New York State uh why not what is it? Um no. Gotta be in it. Why not, like that. You? Why not you? Like that? My wife used to use that line, like because it's not. Yeah, the lottery is a con. Like, to be clear, but I get why people want to buy into the con. It's this idea of, like, things aren't going great, but if this if this lottery ticket hits, everything's going to be but, different. But, oh, hey, you never know. Hey, you never know. That's oh, the lie. But hey, you, you never know. But you know what, though? Do you know what, though? There are people that just know that they don't have any mobility opportunity. Isn't right. that what, yeah, the, what we're talking yellow about? Yellow capitalism. Exactly. So, in other wor- so in other words, they spent how much? 600 bucks. 
the so people in the lowest that's income 5%, bracket, five percent of their income. Well, first, of, first of all, that's probably not coming out of their income. In that bracket, there are people that are getting some form of public assistance. It doesn't matter; it's their income. I get it, but I'm saying eh, people don't necessarily think of it that way. Um, but it's not the craziest idea when you consider the alternatives, which is to never take any chance on anything and have zero chance of. So is six hundred dollars excessive? Are you yeah. advocating that they spend more? It's- no, I just don't think it's this. I don't think it's the Josh is bullish thing. on the lottery. Yeah. I've never bought a lottery. Honestly, I bought like scratch off stuff. Yeah. And and then I just, I've done like office pools when the thing gets to like two billion. I don't, or but whatever. so here's the other thing. I don't even I don't gamble at all. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I don't have that that gene. I'm, no, I'm the same way. I just it's like a way to be <laughs> part of something. You know? But a hundred like, billion is I mean, that is a lot. It's, no, it's of people something. that go to the store every day, yeah. they buy a lottery ticket. Yeah. They got their lucky numbers. I also, I also think that this data is heavily skewed by the the junkies for lack of a better word the people that, that spend all of their money there i don't think the average person is spending six percent or five i mean, I would I mean it is the it's average not. right right but i'm saying the average is dragged I, up a lot by if, people well, right. if that's yeah. the case someone that is doing a bad job because you should keep you know like so average better or people. worse though than somebody that's betting 12 football games every sunday exactly that's i don't true. i don't know way worse it's way worse it's worse Why is it worse i think because people are generally generally responsible with their gambling. Oh. It's a dollar though. Yeah. A lottery well, I, tickets a dollar. Well it's I think it's like five now, but oh two. inflation. See that's how yeah, how inflation. much is it? Two? Two dollars. So $2. so who gives a shit? Well if you buy twenty of them it's not two dollars. No, right, well, so that's I'm not advocating buy right? twenty of them. <laughs> yeah. Just say buy thirty. When, and but when you buy two when you buy one or two every day, every year, right? That's a good amount of money that you could Listen, have put if, towards something. If you useful. if you buy two tickets instead of one, you double your chances of wedding. Am I right, Josh? Why do you yes, what that's how it works. Why do you think the pandemic has made people more willing to spend on lotteries? Because to me, that's just stimulus. I, to me, it that's just, just they have more money. It gets back to this idea of but that's, like, but that's, it's, but it's there, not actually a great economy. There was for a spike. A lot of yeah, there was a spike. There are it's a been lot going up, people, but there was a spike. Yeah, yeah. For there are a lot of people for whom the economy is not good. It's not working for them. And this gets back to the Fed argument. I don't think we have time to really get into this part of it. But like, the economy looks good on a lot of levels. But there are a lot of people. And we actually, the journal just did a story about this last week. There's this growing group of people who aren't poor enough to get federal assistance, Mm -hmm. but aren't making enough to feel like they're actually getting by, to to feel like they actually have money left over to do anything. I think I saw somebody make the case that capitalism can't work for everyone. Like that's one of the reasons why it works. And this is not like a unique thought or something I'm advocating for. It was just an observation that there has to be winners and losers. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the pile of losers seems to be growing. Yeah. Or are we more aware of the losers? I don't know that we're more aware of losers. I think the you think, winners you think are that taking there's, bigger games. There's more. Well, that's true. But are there more people suffering economic hardships today than in the past? I I think there's a. I just I don't. I think know the that's economic true. hardship is just different. Yeah. What I think is there's a lot more people who again they don't qualify right because they're not under they're not meeting guys they're not poor enough to yeah. get these federal subsidies but they still like they feel it and I think also the just gargantuan wealth that exists now you people yeah. see that totally you know what I mean people see people driving around Maseratis like yeah. when did you ever it's so, see oh, it's, 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 the, it's, it's, it's relative three hundred thousand dollar car the, now I, that it used to be you'd have to go to like Beverly Hills and you could see maybe uh you know a, a Rolls Royce or something now they're everywhere it's right? relative yeah. and visible yeah and I, I think it's just very people are very aware of just like how much money is out there and so it's like it used to be that you know if I was making twenty five thousand dollars a year I'd be all right I could take care of my family I got a little you know government assistance here and I'm okay but now it's like no I see how much money everyone else has yeah and I'm aware that like I don't have anything put away like I'm just getting by and I think people are really feeling that totally more. I think totally. that's right totally. so the way that I'm bucketing it in my like visual mind is you have the current conditions you know how is my budget doing what can I afford but then there there are the aspirations too and the aspirations yeah. are slipping away. To what Dion said, the Maseratis, you know, I can't afford a house anymore. That's a real problem. But, you know, current conditions, I think you, and I'm not talking on behalf of anybody, but I think you can make a case for people are better off, but they were put so far behind by the 2010s, especially if they weren't invested, Mm -hmm. that there's so much to catch up to. Yeah. And that's that's that, that's what triggers that gambling impulse. It's like, if I don't take this shot, it might never happen for me. Or, and my dream is- so there are, there are some amplifying factors, though. Yeah. Uh, the Bitcoin gamble that your friends took. Yeah, it worked. It worked. Like, 
like obviously worked. It, it worked depending on where you bought in, right? Like if you bought in True. at the peak, you're still down. If you bought and lost your keys. If, yeah, or if you bought and lost you're your good, keys. You're in good, you're in good shape. Well. Um, that's that. <laughs> that's, that's very visible to people. Mm -hmm. And they remember their friends telling them or their family members like, do it, do it, do it. They didn't do it. And then two years ago, they were like, see, that's why I didn't do it. Yeah. And yeah, now and it's now. like, oh, shit. Uh, I had two chances to do it. So is that I think social media amplifies yeah, for sure. these windfalls yeah. that people are experiencing. And it makes it seem more widespread than yeah. it really is. We also shouldn't forget about how unaffordable buying a home is, right? Yeah, it's Affordability out of is out of the lowest yes. it's ever been. We also, you know, college, health expenses, all these things that have actually continued to go up. Yeah. On this ridiculous trajectory. To me, the home, it's almost, a na not almost, it's a national crisis. Yeah. Like it, it's that bad. I would go that far. It really is. Like, I'm not being hyperbolic. It's what? that bad. Affordability. Affordability. For a home? If you, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're trying to buy a home for the first time, you are beyond fucked. Unless you have an inheritance that you can yeah. take today, you're just, you're not doing it. Yeah. And the Fed can't get us out of this. I, I would well, call it a national crisis because there's some serious policy changes. Oh, not, yeah. Not what do you think happens to the value rates? of houses when they cut rates uh, 200 basis points? Think they're going down? I mean, the millennials are buying houses right now. They're buying it. But I'm saying, if you make if you make sorry. mortgages cheaper, You're you think right. that's going to help anybody? Right now, not really. No. Okay, uh, guys, you have fun on the show today. Yeah, fantastic. Of time. Well, listen, it's called the Compound and Friends for a reason. You guys are you guys are the end friends part. There's, there's and, love uh, here. You make the show, and we appreciate you so much. Thank you guys so much for coming. We're going to close with favorites. Uh, Callie, let's hear from you. Are All you right. deleting your favorite as we're about to go to you? <laughs> I'm What's not. I'm reminding right. myself of All my right. favorites. What do you got? Because I have so many. All right. So I'll give you three. Tim. <laughs> I, think I got to look for it. Give that. me all three. What okay. do you got? So Tim Ferriss's podcast episode with Barbara Corcoran. It's like her. a few weeks old. Yeah. But Barbara is the master at marketing and turning it into business. And I'm yes. a nerd who appreciates that. Really good conversation. You got to look a few weeks back. The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. I'm in a really heady space right now. So mm -hmm. Eckhart Tolle is a spiritualist and he talks about, you know, living in the present and why it matters and how you can do it. That's what I'm reading. Very heady. And then I remembered this because I heard it on a podcast, but there's an awesome blog post by Paul Graham. It's from 2009, very, mm -hmm. very old, but it's called The Maker Manager Schedule. And it's all about how you can, if you have like a creative role that also involves some management or some like interfacing that you have to do with uh, employees, it's it tell it basically teaches you how to organize your schedule and why it's important to. I need to read this. Life. You do. It's okay. very good. I'm really not good at that. Okay. Yeah, you should. Like honestly, I, it's, I struggle. It's really hard, but he articulates it in a way that's so understandable, and it it validates a lot of what you're thinking about. Like my my whole day is meetings, and I do my creative work at night. He's okay. like, yes, this is a thing. It's the maker manager difference. So when are you managing and when are you making? And oh, clumping that it. together. And I like being that. Yeah, I'm gonna check that out as well. On yeah. March third, it was a Thursday. Maybe it's not March third, but for for illustration purposes only, okay. I sent Josh and Matt Middleton a calendar invite for Friday, March fourth. Mm -hmm. And then the next morning at eleven o'clock, I see Josh send over a calendar invite <laughs> to me and Matt. I'm like, my invite's no good. And then on Saturday, I see Josh decline the invitation that I sent. That was for like April 27th. Uh -huh. So I sent them the calendar invite. That should have been for the, remember that? Yes. That should have been for the next day. I sent it like six weeks out, inexplicably. So yes. I think we all struggle with our calendars. I've done mm. that before too. Yeah, none, of us, none yeah. of us are naturally good at this, <laughs> yeah. I don't think. Uh, Michael, what are your favorites? This morning on the way into the city, I was listening to our friend Patrick O'Shaughnessy with mm. Ken Langone. Has anybody heard that yet? Not yet. Uh -uh. No. What a storyteller. Unbelievable. Ken Langone's amazing. Unbelievable. Yeah. I cannot recommend that highly enough. Uh, I want to listen to that. I think I'll do that. You're going to love it. I think I'm going to do that on the way home. Uh, Dion. Me? Dion, what do you got? So I, I just got two things. One, right now I'm reading the Elon Musk biography by, by Isaac Sin. Isaac Sin. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Isaac Sin, like, I had not read one of his books before. I want to go back and read the Steve Jobs after this. I'm like 70% I didn't read that right. one. I read the Ben Franklin one. That was so good. A million years ago. Yeah. I loved it. So yeah, I know, because it just, I didn't realize what a great writer he is. Oh, he's, he's strong to quite strong. Yeah. so good. And so I, I'm just, I was, I'm not a big Elon guy. I feel like there's a lot more hype than there should be, but the book is incredible and I'm really enjoying it. It's important it. to understand understand the Elon story, whether I, yeah. you like him or not. Exactly. Because he's very central to a lot of big stuff. And Isaacson yes. got to ride along with him for like, I think years. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And then the other, the thing I'm watching is a uh, physical 100 on Netflix. 
What is that? It. It's uh, cha- it's, challenges. Right? Yeah, it's this thing in Korea where they take like athletes, wrestlers, um, just bodybuilders, just people who you know put a lot of work into their bodies, and then they make them compete against each other mm-hmm. in like either one on one or team things. So it's like the first few episodes, they make people go up against each other one on one and try to like. It's just you're on these courses, and there's a medicine ball, and whoever finishes with the medicine ball at the end of three minutes wins. We have a five k coming up. The JP Morgan 5K. Oh, you guys, I was going to run that. I'm walking it. You're not, you're not, you can't run 5K. I, I'm signed up for that. I really, I don't know if I'm, I'm dead serious. We should, we should make a team. Wait, do you, right, yeah. do you think you're going to run it faster than I am? I'm walking. I told you. Will you try to run it and then let me ram that comment down your throat? I will be very serious. Yeah, you can okay. ram it down my throat. If I'm, you run, literally, if you fit- I'm literally training. <laughs> you're training right now? I'm literally training. All right, you better awesome. be. I want you to- Can we have side bets? I, there, see, I, no feed way, on this I feed on your There's doubt. no way Josh can run three and a half miles or whatever I it is. feed on your Wait, duration. wait, we've got to have like a minute though. Like what's the, what's I don't your, care how many miles. Minutes. Even if you do it in 40, I'll be impressed. He doesn't even think no, I can no, no, finish you can it. Walk you can walk it He can't, he can't. You he, don't think, you don't think he'll finish no, it? No. Oh, wow. No. Dude, I'm literally finishing, I'm the literally disrespect. finishing three mile runs like three, four days a week. Okay, good for you then. I'll take it back. Are you going to run or are you going to walk? I can't run a 5K. I'm going to disqualify you from it then. No, I'm You're walking. No, I'm, <laughs> can, I'm I, going. can I have Michael spot? Because I need a, I need a team to run, run with. I'm going to be Michael Bannon. I, yeah. I mean, we don't Michael have any Bannon. walkers. We don't no, have any walkers. No, okay. Well. So, you understand it's a team sport and they're looking at our team Do you time. understand Listen. I have shin splints? <laughs> you're gonna drag down. You're gonna drag down Listen, our team Josh, average, though. Josh, I'm running seven minute miles. Yeah, baby. Yeah, put, me in. <laughs> put me in. Put me in. He's gonna torch the whole. Let team. me get. Let me get on the team. The problem with you coming in and being that good is that they're gonna investigate us. Because <laughs> <laughs> you literally can't have right, well, listen, Let me. Let me just in get a part time job yeah. right here at, at Ridholz Wealth Management. Did you, know you ever run? Um, did you ever run the uh, the J P Morgan corporate I, challenge? Yeah, I've, I've done it a couple times. I've done it. Michael doesn't believe me. I did it in two thousand six. <laughs> I did though. <laughs> Pixar didn't happen. I did things. though. I was Pixar, Pixar didn't, didn't happen. happen. Thank you, Callie. I really, I really did it. Uh, I have two favorites. The future Metro Boomin album is incredible. Oh, with uh, the Kendrick diss. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it would be the minute it dropped. I didn't even have to hear all seventeen tracks. But I'm wow. through it like five times, and it's like keeps did getting you, better. Did you like the J Cole album? Uh, no, I won't listen to it now because oh, I wow, feel like it's a half ass project. No. Oh, because okay. No, I don't like what he did. Okay. So he like uh, apologized two yeah, days after was, putting it out. That was bad. He I, said he was proud of the project. Oh, that's He just lame. said that diss. I know it was it was super lame. I, and as a, I'm a J. Cole fan, I was like, oh. So, so am I. He'll, he Jermaine, will, that was a bad look. It's very mature of him and he's done. Right, yeah. He's, he's not over. He's not coming back from I this. Yeah. I So I heard his his real new album, The Fall Off, is supposed to be his retirement album right. anyway. Yeah. Mm. Good move. Yeah. Because, <laughs> no, nah, because I don't think you could do what he just did, like, honestly. Well, that's, a, I mean, it's a new day, right? Like, I think a lot of people thought when Drake got bodied by Pusha T, that was it for him. And he's, he's not, he's he actually not didn't away. even respond. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And like, Pusha T killed him. And he's still, you know, Drake is still out there making number one hits. Yeah. People can come back from anything these days. I don't, it's not the 90s. I, so I don't, so the, so if Kendra comes out with something for Drake or Drake strikes first or whatever, I don't think anyone can diss Drake as hard as Push did, and it didn't really have any effect. Yeah, it wasn't. That's what I'm What's saying. What's the album that came out right after Scorpion? And it was like a double disc, and he like absolutely crushed it. Like he, I don't, yeah. I don't actually think that this is analogous because Cole basically shot himself in the head. What's your so, second favorite? My second favorite. <laughs> no, what? I, I have another favorite. Uh, oh, yeah. What else am I going to say? Eh, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, my second favorite was Physical 100. Okay. That was how we got on the J.P. Morgan Road Race. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate it. I want to say spe- extra special thanks to our guests. Uh, Dion, you killed it today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Callie, absolutely crushed it. You guys are true returning champions. We appreciate you. Duncan, was there anything else we needed to do? Good to go? Yeah, we're good. All right, guys, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>